Time for another board game review, and this time we have the game Puerto Rico. This was sent to me by uh, Rio Grande Games, and is designed by Andreas Seyfarth. Prospector, captain, mayor, trader, settler, craftsman, or builder. Which roles will you play in the new world? Will you own the most prosperous plantations? Will you build the most valuable buildings? You have but one goal, achieve the greatest prosperity and highest respect. This is shown by the player who owns the, who earns the most victory points. All right, let me show you how to play. So in Puerto Rico, the game is played over several rounds, and each round, each player chooses one of seven different roles, uh, as you can see over here, and uh, thereby offers all players in clockwise order the action associated with that role. So for example, if you pick the mayor uh, role, everyone else gets to be the mayor after you. With the settler, you can uh, place new plantations. With the craftsman, you can pr produce goods. Uh, you can sell goods with the trader uh, or ship them as the captain. Um, you can earn money from sales uh, and build buildings with the builder. The player who best manages the changing roles with their associated actions and special privileges will achieve the greatest prosperity and the highest respect and thereby win the game. So, with the, so the winner is the player who earns the most victory points. So whoever has the governor card gets to choose first. They start the round. And they choose one of these roles. Now the prospector role you don't actually use if there are three players, but I'm gonna go ahead and go through each of these roles really quickly. We've got the settler, the mayor, the builder, the craftsman, the trader, the captain, and the prospector. And I will go into detail uh, with those roles in a sec. So if I pick the settler, um, I would do the action of that role, and then every other player also gets to do the settler action. And once everyone else has done the settler action, the next player goes and they will pick one of the remaining roles. So let's say they pick the builder. Then they do the building action, and then the other players also get to do the building action. So it's very important to think about, if I choose a specific action, I am giving that action to everyone else as well. Any roles that aren't chosen, get the doubloons placed on them. So let's say these three were chosen and these three were not. I would put a doubloon on each roll card that was not chosen. You then placed all the roll cards back and then the left neighbor of the player with the governor card takes the governor card and they become the governor for the next round and they get to choose the first roll for the next round and so on. Now each roll has a special privilege on the card. And so if you pick this uh, roll, the thing under here is your special privilege you get. So for the settler, you can do a quarry instead of a plantation. Only you can do that if you choose this role. Also, if you pick a role that has doubloons on it, you get those doubloons. So the more doubloons that pile on unused roles, the more enticing those uh, roles become. If you choose a role, you always take that action first before the others in clockwise order. Uh, you must take a role card, but you don't have to use the action or privilege but of course everyone else gets to use that action on their turns. So let's go into the rules and into more detail. So let's look at the settler card. This lets you place a new plantation, or if you pick this role, you can put a quarry instead of a plantation, and you would put it on your island space over here on your individual board. So looking over here, this is the current uh, available plantations. You can pick one, let's say Indigo, and you would place it on your island. And then every other player would get to pick a uh, plantation tile and then you would re uh, replace the market with new ones. And if you were the one who picked this role, you can do a quarry instead, which I'll explain what those are later. If you fill all 12 island spaces, you cannot place any more plantations on your island. And if you run out of quarry tiles, you can no longer use that special privilege. Now, if you look at the tiles, um, they have little circles on them. That's where colonists go. With the colonist roll, you can uh, take a colonist and place it. And the special privilege is the mayor gets one colonist more from the supply. In order for tiles to function, they need to have a colonist occupying the circle. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. So with the mayor roll, we look at the colonist ship here, and each player uh, takes turns taking one colonist from the colonist ship until there are no more colonists. And remember, whoever picked the mayor role gets one colonist more from the supply. Then what a player can do is place the colonists uh, together with any colonists they have from earlier rounds on any empty circles. So if I had one colonist, I could put it on here. If I had more than that, I could fill some more spaces up here. If you can't place all your colonists, you can uh, store them in the city of San Juan over here. 
uh, and they remain there until a later mayor phase, and then later they can be placed on empty circles in a subsequent turn. As your last duty, uh, the mayor puts new colonists on the colonist ship. What you have to do is count all the empty circles uh, on all players' boards, uh, and that's how many colonists go on the colonist ship. As a minimum, though, you have to at least put as many colonists on the ship as there are players in the game. Uh, so if you were at three players, you have to at least put three, but if there are more uh, empty circles than that on all the boards, you would be more. Now let's look at the builder. Um, the builder can build a building, obviously. If you choose this role, the special privilege is you get a building cost minus one doubloon. Um, all of the buildings here have a cost in the, in the circle here, and so this would cost three doubloons. But if you picked the builder role, you would get a one doubloon discount. So you would pay the appropriate number of doubloons, and then you would place it in your city. Uh, and the placement actually doesn't matter. If you buy a big old building, you're gonna need two spaces. Now here's where the quarries come in. For every occupied quarry, meaning every quarry you own that has a colonist on it, um, you can reduce the cost of buildings by one doubloon each. There is a restriction, uh, for example, in this uh, column here, you can only go up to two quarry discount, this one three quarry and four quarry discount. Um, so it's not like you can just go crazy on quarries and get a bunch of stuff for free. So in this column, you can only use one quarry as a discount. However, the builder's privilege is in addition to the quarry. So if you picked the builder role and had a quarry, you could actually get a two doubloon discount in this column. And now we have the craftsman. The craftsman's role is production. Um, what you do is you take goods from the supply, and these are the goods right here, um, according to your production ability, and you place them on your windrows. All your um, uh, goods and your doubloons are public knowledge. Now with buildings, each player may build each building only once. The brown number in the top right corner uh, represents the victory points this building is worth at the end of the game, even if it is unoccupied. Now in order to produce goods, you need to have a plantation and a plant. The only exception to that is corn. But for most goods, uh, for this, it'd be one colonist in a plantation, one colonist in a plant, that would give you one indigo good. So if you had a setup like this, where you had uh, one indigo plantation occupied and one in the plant, uh, one, uh, one sugar and two coffee, you would get one indigo, one sugar, and two coffee. And the craftsman's uh, special privilege is they get one extra good from the supply from what they can produce. So they could get one extra coffee, one extra sugar, or one extra indigo. Now let's talk about the trader. The trader uh, may immediately sell one good to the trading house. You take from the bank the price associated with the good you sell, plus one doubloon if you chose this role because that's your special privilege. As you can see, different goods uh, give you more doubloons. So uh, corn would actually give you zero unless you were uh, the special privilege, in which case you would get one doubloon and indigo selling it would give you uh, two doubloons or one. Uh, this would give you two or three with a special privilege and so on. So in clockwise order, everyone can sell a good as long as there are spaces in the trading house and there are only four. So let's say player one sells an indigo, player two sells uh, sugar, and player three sells a coffee. The trader phase ends when all players have had one turn to sell or if the trading house fills up. Now there are special rules for the trading house. There's only room for four goods, so if it's full, even if you're the first person to place one, let's say on, on a following turn, you place another good, it's full. So the other two players don't get to sell anything because you filled up the trading house. And also with the trading house, they can only buy different kinds of goods. So if you put an indigo in the trading house, other players can't sell an indigo until this fills up. So on a turn, if it is full, you remove all the goods and it's empty for a later turn. But if there are less than four, they stay there, and that means on a later trader phase, it will be harder to sell, because like there's only one space, so only one person can sell, and they have very limited options. They can only sell coffee or corn, because it has to be a different good than what is already there. And then we have the captain phase. Uh, this is all about shipping goods uh, on ships. And uh, if you have the special privilege, you get one victory point more added to your total. So if you look over here, we have different ships, and the more players you have, uh, the more ships there are. But with three players, there will be three ships. If you choose the captain role, you get to choose first where to load your goods. Um, and you go around clockwise, as long as one player has goods he can load, you have to keep going around. Now there are very specific rules as far as uh, loading goes. Each ship will carry goods of only one kind. So if you put corn on a ship, that ship is only uh, loading corn from now on. And if you put corn on this ship, that means these ships can't carry corn. If a ship is full, then you can't put goods on that ship. 
on your turn, if you have goods you can load, you have to load them. However, you can only load one kind of goods at a time. So if you have an indigo and tobacco, you couldn't do both on one turn. You'd have to do choose one or the other. And when you load goods, you have to load as many as you can. So let's say there's uh, an indigo ship and there's two, and you have three indigo. You have to put all your indigo on that ship, like so. You can't hold back goods if there's space on the ship carrying those kinds of goods. If you have several kinds of goods you can load on one turn, you can choose freely which ones you want to load on that turn. Now for each good that you load, you get one victory point. It doesn't matter what type of good it is. Uh, each one is worth one victory point and you would get them um, from the supply. The captain, for choosing the roll, gets one extra victory point added onto his total. So that's very different from the trader phase. In the trader phase, the goods have very distinct values, but in the captain phase, uh, they're all they're all worth one victory point each. It doesn't matter. Now your victory points, you can keep face down as a secret from the others. Other information you have to keep public, like doubloons and uh, goods. But with victory points, you can keep that uh, secret. Now, after everyone has uh, stored all their goods on the ships. Uh, whatever goods you could not load, you have to store on your windrows. And you can only store one barrel. So even if you have a lot extra, you have to throw them away. Or put them in special warehouses, which are buildings you can buy. But let's say you don't have any warehouses, then too bad, buddy. You gotta pick one of those barrels and save it, and everything else just goes back to the supply. Wasted. Now, any ships here that are full uh, get emptied. But any ships that have, let's say, a couple barrels on them, stay like that in future captain phases. So it's gonna be more difficult in a later captain phase to load because these ships are already predetermined for what kind of goods they can load. And there's also fewer spaces on the ships. And if you're playing with more than three players, uh, there's the prospector role. Uh, it's no action, but you get one doubloon from the bank. So after each player in the round has chosen a role and all players have done all the roles. So for three players, you're gonna do three different actions uh, in that turn. That's when you put all the doubloons on the unused roll cards, and then you um, pass the governor card, and then you go on and do more rolls. The game ends at the end of a round if one of the following conditions is satisfied. If, at the end of the mayor phase, there are not enough colonists to fill the ship. So let's say you need to put six colonists on here, but you only have four left in the entire supply. Then it looks like the game's over at the end of that round. If one player fills all 12 city spaces, then that round is the final round. And if you run out of victory point chips in the captain phase, then that, that's the last round as well. Then what you do is you add all your victory point chips, you add all the values of your buildings, uh, that's that top right number, and then these big buildings actually have extra VP. So this one says for City Hall, you get one victory point for each violet building. Uh, the Customs House has uh, one victory point for every four victory point chips you have. So those big buildings actually give you some extra victory point bonuses. But remember, they have to be occupied or else you don't get that bonus at the end. Whoever has the most victory points at the end is the winner. Now, a big part of the game are these buildings here. Um, as you can see, um, the sugar mill here, here you can, uh, if you have three colonists here and three plantations occupied, uh, you can do uh, up to three sugar per um, production. The office lets you uh, sell the same kind of goods as others. It lets you kind of bypass that rule. The university, you get plus one colonist during the building phase for building. Uh, there's a lot of different little bonuses here uh, you can take advantage of. The warehouse is for extra goods. Uh, so you don't have to throw away all your stuff away if you have extra goods in the uh, captain phase. The hacienda, you get plus one plantation from the supply during the settler phase. So there's tons of different things you can do to sort of upgrade your city uh, and give you more perks during specific phases. So I really like the game. Uh, choosing roles and having everyone do the action is a very f interesting kind of fun mechanic, uh, especially because you know each role has a different privilege and you can get extra coins depending on the role that you pick. Uh, it does make you really strategize which role you want to take because sometimes that special privilege is exactly what you want uh, for that turn. You want to take actions that benefit you, but you also don't want to benefit the other players too much. Uh, you can actually basically sabotage them and make them lose goods, extra goods, uh, with the captain phase or uh, waste turns. Uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, looking at other people's situations and going, okay, if I choose this action, that guy's gonna get screwed over because he's not ready for that role. It has the appearance of a la la la, grow your crops and get little goods and sell them, but it's actually a very cutthroat game. The order of turns matters a lot 
for actions. Like with the captain phase, if the ships are full, going first with that captain role is essential. Because in some cases, if the ships are full, you're screwed. Same with the trading phase. Uh, if you if you fill up the trading house, the other two players don't get to do anything. There's definitely a lot of ways you can kind of uh, really mess with other people uh, by the roles you pick. If anything, the roles are almost more important than <laughs> being successful in your city or plantation. I mean, both are important, but I don't know. There's a lot of sort of mean stuff you can do in this game. I like that the turns go really quick uh, because everyone gets to do actions constantly. You pick an action, everyone gets to do the action. They pick an action, hey, you're gonna get to do an action right away. There's not a lot of downtime. You know, the actions go by quick and you're always paying attention to see, oh, what did they pick? Ooh, what am I gonna do now on with that action on my next turn? It's very, very quick, quick uh, turnaround for turns. It's all about efficiency and good decisions. There's almost no luck in this game. The only luck I can think of is uh, at the beginning, the plantation tiles that you can uh, pick from are randomized and that's luck based. But other than that, it really boils down to pure strategy. Uh, it's a very solid and very thinky game and kind of a mean one too, but I really liked it. Very good.